All right, I think we're on. Well, good morning. Thanks, Mark, for your wonderful presentation prior to ours. Yeah. Uh, Todd Cruz, I'm the lead mentor for 7068. I have our team captain 70 from 7068, Jake Lynn, today helping present. We're going to be going over the FRC control system. We're just going to give you a basic overview of all the components on there, uh, talk about the different programming languages and stuff, and give everyone ideas about this. Um, what we like to ask all the time is if there's new members that have never seen this control system, if you just put it in the chat, it'd be awesome. Um, we like to kind of know where our audience is in here, but this is going to be just a basic overview of everything to give you an idea of what the, the FRC control system is all about. So what we like to always start with is the, the Kia joke here that you see on the, your, the slide presentation here. And he's a, this guy's applying for a job. And the first thing he comes in the office and the guy's like, here, make your own chair and sit down on it. So on robotics, it's, it's a lot the same thing because when we start out with robotics, you get to all these wonderful control system pieces. You get the robo reel, you get all the stuff you see on this board here, just one of our electrical boards here. And you got to figure out how to get it to work, right? So we always like to say is, a lot of people like to talk about the electrical and the control system people, but you can't talk without us. I mean, anything on the robot, it goes through us to make it work. So all the great things that Mark just went through in his presentation on the manipulators and actuators and stuff, you won't be able to move any of them without the basic FRC control system. So on the tail contents here, we're gonna be going through the, what all these mean, the power distribution panels and the MAC controller, which is the PCM. And if you've been around first for a while, we love to use our acronym. So we'll all say PDB or the PCM or the BRM and that, and we're gonna break that all down so everyone knows what other thing means on that. So we're gonna also go through the motion controllers that uh, run all the wonderful manipulators and stuff, the status lights, the radio, uh, the robo reel and different things with the uh, uh, expansion ports and stuff available on the robot reel. So Jake, wanna go over the basic overview here? Yep, all right, so uh, you guys can see this. This is like the uh, entire robot, but it's off of the, uh, it's, uh, you can't, it's not like on a board like this. It's just kind of broken down for you. So the big gray, uh, the big gray square on the left of the screen there, that is the robo reel. So that's gonna be like the brains of the robot. That's gonna be, you know, where your, all your programming goes. That's gonna control everything. Um, Let's see, next to it is the status light. So that's the RSL that blinks when the robot is enabled and this stays solid when the robot's not enabled. So what that does is that just, you know, that's kind of like a safety warning. So if the robot's on, it's kind of warning you to stay away from it, be careful, things like that. Uh, right above the robo reel, you guys can see there's the little uh, white bridge access point. That's, uh, that's your, uh, the, like that's where the uh, control system hooks up to. That's like that's for uh, that's for actually controlling the robot remotely. Uh, next to that, you have the voltage regulator, which powers it. Um, next to that, we see the air compressor. That's if you're running pneumatics, so that's a whole separate thing. So you have your PCM, which controls your solenoid and it also gives power to the compressor and stuff like that. You have a pressure switch, which will shut off your compressor once you get to the regulated, or once you get to the temperature that uh, FRC or FIRST Robotics allows you to have, which I believe is 120 PSI. Um, the uh, big rectangle next to all that on the right of the screen, that's the PDP. So that's distributing power to everything else on the board. And um, your battery is actually hooked up to that. So your power goes directly into that. And then you have several fuses here to just for circuit protection, things like that. Uh, you've got uh, all, your, all your motor controllers are run through this. Um, yeah, so that's what that does. And then you have your battery and this is, this is the circuit breaker. We don't have a battery here, but your battery will run through the circuit breaker. And now I believe an important thing to remember with the circuit breaker is you always run the positive lead of the battery through the circuit breaker. Don't run the, don't run the negative lead through the circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? Yep. Okay. Uh, what's up? What else is there? Oh, motor controllers. That's on the other side of the board. 
So these are these are talons, and these are what's used to control the motor. They're plugged into the PDP, and then the motors come off the motor controllers. And then the, the motor controllers also have a CAN bus, and this actually runs back to the robo reel, and this is the communication line for the for the uh, motor controllers. And uh, I don't have any spark motor controllers on here, but those are run with uh, PWM signal wires instead of the CAN bus. That also runs back to the Robo Rio, but it's plugged into the PWM ports instead of the CAN bus. So it's a little bit different, but uh, yeah, that's that's about it for this slide. Yep. So this is the basic snapshot. Now we're gonna break it down a little bit more so we can get a better feel of this. So on the power distribution board, uh, Jake's gone through a lot of it on here, but this function is allows to bring the power in from the battery and distribute it in individual circuits throughout your robot. So if you're controlling a, a different pneumatic controllers or different motors, each one would first would put out in their game manual for the electrical specifications is each one has to be in its individual breaker. And these are auto resettable breakers. So one thing on here is when you put these breakers in there, sometimes they're really tough to get in there. And sometimes when you get them from Andy Mark or other suppliers at first, they are a little bit longer, so you might have to trim them down, but we wanna make sure you get them seated completely down into the, the board here or else you will have nuisance issues. Yeah, sometimes like if you're drilling on your robot, metal shavings could fall in there and cause issues. Correct. So here's a little bit of a better breakdown of the hookup on here. The panel is hooked up to the battery, to the breaker, and that's the main disconnect breaker right here that we're showing you. And what's important about this when you're mounting these on your robot is make sure you put it in a way that another robot can't breach your perimeter and accidentally knock the breaker off. Now, that's against the rules of all the games that we've been involved with, but it also happens. And so make sure it, you design it and it's behind it and um, it also has to be out in the open so you can get at it because it is an e-stop and it's an emergency stop that will kill all the power and that's why it's important you run the red wire through the breaker and into your board is to kill all the power so there's nothing on the, the robot once you hit that breaker. The motor controllers are then plugged into each of the ones which we're talking about all through here and then we'll talk about the breakers here a little bit. Uh, this module is called the PCM. It's the pneumatics control module. So this is the, what you'd use to control all your solenoids. Um, on the bottom, the compressor output, that's where you plug in your air compressor. And the pressure switch is plugged in next to it that shuts off the air compressor once the, the PSI reaches 120. Um, on the top and bottom there the, with the purple, uh, that's the solenoid channel. So that's what you plug the solenoid into. Uh, then uh, next to that in the green box, that's the CAN bus. That's where the CAN signal wires go to. Uh, next to that is the power supply in red. And then- um, runs back to the power distribution board here. You know, and then the, you can also have a 12 or 24 volt mode. And I believe that depends on what types of solenoids you're using. Yes. So what's really important about this slide, and as well as a lead mentor, I'm also a control system advisor during uh, the regional events. And we've always have questions once in a while, why our solenoid doesn't work? And the first question I asked a student that's asking me why it doesn't work is, what is your coil voltage on your solenoid? Now these solenoids come in 24 volts and 24 volts. So what's important when you want to use pneumatics that were talked about in previous session was, is you got to go through your inventory, and make sure all your solenoids are the same coil voltage. So you got to make a design decision here as you build your robot. Am I going to use all 12 volt solenoids that have the coil voltage? And the coil voltage is the one that you send the signal out of one of these ports on the zero through three or the four through seven solenoids is, it's either going to put 12 volts out to that solenoid or it's going to put 24 volts. Now you put a 24 volt on a 12 volt uh, solenoid valve, it may work for a few times and it may just go out and may burn it up if it doesn't have enough protection on it. So you want to make sure and if you have a 24 volt coil on your solenoid and you're using 12 volts, it's not going to work. It's going to maybe work once in a while, but most of the time it's not going to work at all. 
So make sure you pay attention when you want to use pneumatics on your robots that you're using it. And all you have to do is slide that jumper over to the 12 volt or then the 24 volt area. Also on this module, when you look at it, as we break through and through another screen here, is they have um, on there, underneath there is LEDs when you turn them on, will come on for each one. So I just wanted to point that out. On this, it's on the back side of this oh, one. So on here, we'll talk about the CAN bus here in a moment, but it's very important that the CAN bus gets wired to the robo reel. And that's your communications from the main computer um, controller on your robot to all your devices. So as you've seen on there, we, we showed you the compressor one has to be wired in and there's also a pressure switch on there that will make sure that you have the right power on there. So what it does, like Jake said, if it gets up to that 120, it's supposed to shut the compressor off. And if it does go over, that's what the pressure release valve is with the switch that comes in there. So it tells the, the firmware and the controller to shut off. Next, we have the voltage regulator or the VM, VRM module that regulates what? They anyone know what the VMR is? It's kind of confusing because we used to use them for primarily our radios. So the first thing I'm going to point on this module, if you're thinking about putting some lights on your robot or power some other thing for the your cameras and that, don't do it on um, this one. You add a second one. It's perfectly legal to add two of these modules on there. But what this module does is it, it regulates the voltage out of these modules. So if you're using a 12 volt on here, it will regulate 12 volts and keep it. No matter if your battery power goes down, if your battery starts losing less than 12 volts, this module is going to boost it up and always try and maintain that 12 volts out there. So what's important is you pay attention to this diagram or look into the actual documentation provided from the vendor on this is it's real easy to burn these modules out. Now it's $70. Not what we want, but if you're on a tight budget with your build robot building, you may want to consider looking at this a little closer before you start hooking things up to it. Because if our team has done it, we've burned them up before. So the voltage on here has got the two amps and it's got the 500 milliamps. Not a whole lot. It's a half a amp current going out of the modules. So pay attention. It's 12 and 5 volts on here. What's also important to note on here is the only legal way to set this thing up and wire it is what's called the 20 amp breaker on the power distribution board. On the right, you'll see this yellow fuse right here. It's a plug-in, it's an automotive type plug-in uh, fuse on there. And this is the only legal way to run this is to run that off of the power distribution board. The only exception would be if you're using two of these and we've done it once in a while, if you're using a string of lights or some LEDs and uh, other lights on there, you can run a second VRM module on here. So pay attention to these. These are all push-in type uh, on the white here. Uh, these are push-in spring-loaded terminals. Make sure you use the correct ferrules and stuff when you're mounting these and wiring to it because you, it's easy to break these out as well and they get jammed in there if you use the wrong wire gauge. So, uh, typically, these are 18-gauge wire wired to it. All right, next we're going to talk about motor controllers. So here on the board, we have a couple different kinds. We have the one on the screen is the is the top row here. These are the Talon SRXs. And then on the bottom here, these are an older edition. They're just the Talons. We don't really use those anymore. So the Talon SRX is kind of the new, the new thing we use. Uh, they're basically just used to control the motors. Um, the uh, white lead is positive. I think the green is negative. And then the red and the black, those run back to the PDP. And then the other, the white and the green, those are what goes to the motor. Um, you can actually plug an encoder into these to figure out motor counts. So you can, so you can like, instead of just having a free spinning motor, you're, you know, you might want to have like a control an arm or something like that. So you can put an encoder on there to uh, figure out like how, how many rotations the motor has spun and that's plugged into the port which is located right here um yeah do you have anything else to say about these? no they also have limit switches you can put in here 
on here. So this is white piece right here. You remove that and it's a 10 pin ribbon cable that can come off of there. And there's a variety of different uh, accessories available on uh, Cross the Rover Electronics website, CTRE. Um, Vexpro has them as well as Andy Mark and the other suppliers at first to do this. So this is a CAN bus connection only. The CAN bus is the one that will has the green and the yellow wires coming off it. They will all run in a daisy chain back to the Robo Reel for communications. So these are compact or light. They're about $90 a piece, depending on if uh, they go up or down here, but they're $90. So here's another one here is called the Vectors, or the Victors, excuse me, the, Vic, the Victors is the lighter weight version of the uh, Talon. It has a lot of similar uh, features that the Talons has on it. Um, it doesn't have the direct encoder on there, but you can do some other things with it. And these are half the cost. These are around $40, $45 um, things, but very useful in the way to do it because they're also CAN bus. And uh, we're going to explain that in a minute as we get through the presentation here with the difference between CAN bus and PDB and what considerations you would want with that. But these are very usable where you're just spinning a wheel and you don't care um, if you need any feedback. So if you're doing an intake, for instance, and you just want to spin some wheels and pull in a, a game piece, these are very practical and easy to use. And then what the main thing we want to point out as well is there used to be concern with older electronic stuff. Um, some of the old uh, Victors and um, I'm trying to think of the other motor controllers, they were open and they had vents on there where shavings could get into the thing and burn them out. These are all sealed and low profile liar to use on your robots. And you, you can see the LEDs on here too. They got um, diagnostics on here as well. You know, green would be going positive output to the motor and the uh, red would be a negative one. And if you ever see them flashing an amber, something means there's a, there's a air or some type of uh, alarm going on with the inside of controller. The pigeon, and my, my captain here saying not much, but we used the, the pigeon on our last robot. Um, this is a great way to use an IMU. So what that does is it allows us to do headings on the robot. So if we're gonna profile out a move here, we can design it to get our field orientation on here. And so a little piece is not very big. And you can, we did 3D printed a, a little holder for this and it's got a ribbon cable and this can plug right, right into the talent. So another thing with these talons they are expensive, but they're a workhorse. So you can plug a lot of things in here. And what we can do is we can get the different headings we're going on there. We can get our acceleration. We can, you can see the speed we're going on here if you calculate it in using the loop control inside the talent. So very powerful thing to do here. Um, use it for autonomous a lot of times for our movements. So we want to head a certain direction. We'll use our encoder feedback and we can head to our direction and stop or turn or whatever we need to do. So these are really useful if you want to do a 90 degree turn, for instance, I want to go straight and I want to do a right turn and set myself up to do the next move. You can use this piece of device in there and it's just 12 volt source external to that. And then everything feeds right into the talent and you can read up the software. All right, uh, this is a Spark. It's about the same size as a Talon SR. It features a 60 amp continuous current with uh, passive cooling and limit switches for smart mechanism control. It has RGB status and uh, button activated brake and coast mode. These are basically like a cheaper version of, a, of like a, you know, any other motor controller. And so if you don't want to buy a CTRE controller, you can buy one of these. They are controlled by PWM instead of uh, the CAN bus. So that's a little bit different, which I mean, you, that's just a programming thing. So you have to program them a little bit differently. They're, in, they're more, in, they're, they're less expensive than the CTRE stuff, and they're basically for if you just want to, you know, spin a motor to intake something or run a flywheel or something like that. Right. So the fundamental thing you want to look at on here is the screw terminals right here. So if you saw the talons or the Victor SPXs, they had molded cable wires coming out of the controller itself. 
These you have to run wires and then you have to put eyes on them. And you know, it's in our termination point. So you have to put a connector on there. And then what happens a lot of times these loosen up if you don't get enough Loctite or something on it, these could loosen up and short out. So on design standpoint, here's where the things you wanna look at. Space, these are wider. They're, they're about the same height, but they're wider and they're a cheaper module, but there's more work involved. The other ones you put connectors on there and you can just plug them in your motors and go, these you have to make connectors on here and you gotta run a PWM cable all the way down to wherever you have this mounted to. Um, this got similar light status on here. It's got a blue light on here that will come on here, but it also does the red and uh, the red and the green as well for telling you the direction it's putting out from the motor controller. Uh -huh. The talons, the victors, and the spark should be close to the. Well, I can't see from the because of the. the yeah, can you move the the people over to the other side? Okay, close to the PDP so that the wires don't have to be lengthened or shortened. Uh, the wires on the motor side should utilize the connectors so they don't need to be shortened every year until they're unusable. We like to use Anderson pole connectors for that. And then we can just, you know, pull them off an old robot and put them on our new robot. It just saves us money and time. So it's just kind of nice. There's what I was looking for, the Jag wires. They're not even legal anymore to use, but uh, you can see it's a big monster thing and it's got the holes and a lot of shavings used to get in there and burn them out. But this is a snapshot of comparison on here. You can find these online. Um, doesn't really have a lot of the newer controller stuff for the Talon SRXs and that, but um, the Victor SPX and stuff here. And it's a basic chart snapshot showing what the mix, the different specs are. Is it the voltage on your same? Does it have a sensor input? Does it use PWM, was, which is pulse width modulation, which should explain that, what that is. Um, that's the way the signal comes out of the controller to the drive itself. Um, then it's got the surge current stuff. So it's just a snapshot of what they are and the max currents it can pull on these. So my big thing when I mentor students is I always wanted to understand what the specs are, the specifications from the manufacturer, because it's very important when you're integrating stuff in that you understand what it is and then how to integrate it into your robot and designs. Um, just this is our slide, it just kind of showed um, what the actuators and uh, motor controllers that were legal. Um, first doesn't really say anything for the next, 2021 season, but I expect it to be about the same as it was here since they're pre playing the game. Um, just some information, but always pay attention what is legal and what's not legal when you're concerning your robot design. So here's more, just shows you the main bots, the window motors and stuff like that that can be integrated in. As the, the Falcon and the new stuff comes out now, there's always newer controllers not being developed. So this, this is where we always like to uh, ask questions. If there's any questions on what we presented it so far, let us know in the chat window. There was a question about what does it, what does that do again? What, uh, can you explain exactly what that is? Which piece you want clarification on? If there's something you want to clarify, just let us know. The PCM module, the pneumatic control module. So that's if you're using uh, pneumatics and uh, pneumatics is if you're using a cylinder or air that's going to manipulate something that uh, Mark, if you're in an earlier session that Mark was explaining that it's a uh, We've used it for controlling lights, for instance, as one time as well. But what it's made to do is a standalone module that if you want to put valves on there, open and close valves. And what the Mac controller does is when you tail it with a push button of a controller, you can turn on the solenoid that will let air through a system to either push the cylinder close or push it or pull it back open or close. And so that's what the pneumatic controller does. 
And what the great thing about the module is, you don't have to mount it on your main board here. So what we've done in the past is we've taken this module, running voltage down to it in this CAN bus and put all our valves lower, closer to what we're using it for the mechanics on it. Is there any other questions? No, you cannot connect. So if you're watching the chat, you cannot connect motors to the voltage regular. The voltage regular, the number one reason why the voltage regular is on the robot is what is the most important thing on your robot besides how you're gonna drive it and move it is the radio connection. So that's what first to put it on there. It connects right to your radio. And we have a radio on here, right here. This radio right here, this is your link. So when you're sitting at your driver's station or your laptop and you're running around the school, you don't need to be hardwired to the robo reel. You connect to this radio. And that's one thing you want, the communication to always be on and keep that voltage to it. So that's what the voltage regular is for. And that's really what the reason that it's on there and the, probably the one of the only reasons you will use the VRM. Do not hook fans to it. We've had to hook a fan up to it and it draws too much current and then it will blow that module up. Any other questions? All right, we're gonna move to the next slide then. All right, that's the RSL, that's your safety light. So if it's a solid orange, that means that the robot is off and not being, uh, it can't be controlled by the remote. If the light is blinking, that means that the robot is enabled and can be controlled and you should take caution when being around it while that light's blinking. All right, so really important to know here is the jumper right here in this. Again, when I go through these regionals, I see teams, I'll get a call from the FTA. They say, go check out number team number X. And if you forget this jumper, it won't give the right status on the field. And uh, the FTAs, which is the field technicals um, assistants up there, the ones that run the field uh, when you do gameplay, um, these statuses mean something. So we can tell if your robot's enabled, disabled, or an e-stop, whatever it is. So it's a very important you put that jumper in there between LA and LB. Uh, this is the radio. Uh, the best way to mount this is horizontally and away from metal and sources of uh, RF noise, such as the VRM and the battery. Uh, the antennas are positioned along the edges of the case. Uh, so mounting the radio horizontally will maximize the antenna radiation in the horizontal plane of the playing field. Yeah, it's important that this thing gets power all the time. And if it, if it does, for some reason, lose power, I think it's 45 seconds before it can reboot. So you lose, you lose your connection for 45 seconds if this thing isn't wired properly. Yeah. Very important you have it out in the open and protect it. So 2020 radio first has gave no indication they're gonna switch from this radio anytime soon. Um, so it's the uh, OM5F uh, or 5P, excuse me, um, this radio. It's basically an off the shelf uh, radio that first configures particular, particular to their fields. Um, so if you're not been to a first event for, uh, the first thing you do is you, uh, once you get registered in that and you're going through your inspection, the radio has to be taken off and brought to the programming kiosk to be programmed for the field that you're gonna be playing on. So our recommendation is to use a PoE injector. And what does that mean? It's a power over ethernet. And these are 12 volt um, powered um, radios. And you'll see, we have one on here, but we don't recommend using it. First KOP would always put this out, um, this orange one on here. And you can see we have just the ethernet cable on here. So how we wire that, and we'll get in the very, particulars on uh, next session in uh, November, we're doing our electrical presentation where we get into details of wiring this system. But we use a PoE that's off of the VRM, the voltage regulator, and the 12 volts, and it's feed for a couple of different wires on here along with the ethernet traffic right to the radio. So that's our recommendation is use a PoE. 
Um, you can double it up. The question always is, can you use a barrel ejector um, connector as well, which you can right here. But um, what we've seen is a lot of teams go down. And like Jake said, once it goes down, it's going to take a long time. It's going to feel like an eternity to your robot reconnects to the field. And it only has to drop for a split couple microseconds. We're not taking very long. That power deviates at all and that radio cuts off. You'll be sitting there watching everybody else play. So here's a better look at uh, um, the, the POE that we recommend on here. You can buy them from Amazon, Anymark. Um, usually for about five, $7, you can buy two of these on here. And you can see right here, the Robo reels connected through here to your radio. And then it's connected to the VRM that get that continuous uh, 12 volts power net radio up on it. Just take note, you know, when you when you buy these POA injectors that you plug them in the right direction, you can see how the power's coming in from the VRM and it's continuing on through the blue cable here to it. And it plugs into the first port on the radio. That is your POE um, power and the ethernet traffic into that radio there. And you can see there's no barrel connector on there going to the VRM, it's all fed through the ethernet. And it's a very common use uh, practice in industry. We use them a lot here at Delta as well on different devices. And then you can see it goes back to the robo reel so it can connect. So anytime a signal comes in from the field that comes through the radio, comes through this ethernet cable, the blue one, to the PNG ejector, right into the robo reel, and then goes out to any devices it's talking to. Uh, these, this is the Robo Rio. Uh, this is, like I said before, this is the brains of the robot. You've got your, uh, you got your input power there in the upper right or upper left corner. Uh, you've got next to that, you've got the USB, you get the USB device. So that's, that's for programming it and controlling it with a wire. So when you're actually at the competition, once you have the radio program, you have to use that USB device. It won't, your radio really can't be used once it's been programmed to work with the FRC field. So you have to use that USB device. And then next to that, you have the USB host. That's for plugging in cameras. So you can have, I guess, up to two cameras, it looks like. So if you want to have cameras on your robot, uh, maybe you want to have one on your manipulator that moves, and maybe you want to have one on your drivetrain or something like that. You can run a maximum of two cameras off there. Uh, you have the Ethernet port, and that's you could run. I guess the the PoE injector seems to uh, run off that. Um, let's see. You get your status LEDs. You got your PWM control, so that would be for sparks and things like that. So you've got your uh, PWM. Uh, let's see. We get your reset button. And then you've got your analog inputs, relay controls. Uh, then your robot signal light plugs into this too. So you got to make sure that, that the uh, RSL is plugged in. Uh, you got your digital input outputs. So those are like uh, simple on or off circuits. Uh, the analog is for, uh, I, I'm guessing, what is it, 8 bit? Is it 0 to 255? Yep, and it's uh, for your sensors. You can have uh, analog sensors and stuff plugged in there. Yeah, and then I believe switches then are plugged, like limit switches are plugged into the DIO, right? Yes. Okay. Um, custom electronics port, I, would that be for like Arduinos? Yeah, you can put stuff, Raspberry Pi stuff off of here to customize and other IMUs. So any other things that come in here is the SPI port. Um, they also have a serial port here. There's some devices and IC2 communication port as well for doing it. So your CAN bus is right here. So what's important to note here now when you're doing your design um, considerations and using all these components is if you always wanna run back to this board, this is what we kept talking about the PWM ports right here. Each time you hook one of them motor controllers up with PWM, which is pulse width modulation, it's a three pin uh, connector. It's a red and it's a black and white cable that will go across. I don't know if I have any, but right here, you can see them right here on there. These are plugged right in and they have to run each one to your device. 
sparks. There's different talons I have them as well. If you're using the CAN bus, the beauty of the CAN bus is you see we have our CAN bus right here on our, our controller here. And that goes out and then it just daisy chains speeding around, Jake. It just, spins, it just goes between daisy chains through each controller. So each one of them drives there, the motion controllers, do not have to have a cable going back to the robo reel. It's all connected through the CAN bus communication system. So very important to understand the difference between a CAN bus and a PWM. You can use both and there's times we'll use them as well. And then any feedback can go in, into here. This is not, a, not an option for the robot single light that always has to be wired onto the robot. And then of course, here's your power connection, which goes back to the power distribution board as well. And you wanna make sure they get a good connection on them as well. So the Robo Reel uses uh, NI, which is the National Instrument Real Time Linux OS, which is used in most of the NI uh, new Robo devices. So the Robo Reel has three mounting features. There's two ways you can do it that we kind of recommend. You can zip tie it down, but our preferred method is, and go back to the Robo Reel there, is you can use the mounting on there. Um, we usually will put a plate in the back here and use the 440 screws in the back side of it. And we make a little sub plate that mounts onto it and then to the board itself. Uh, we find it more reliable than just zip tying it down because this is another device. These things are 500 bucks. They're for something on there or a little bit more, I guess, actually now. And this device here um, needs to be secure because if that goes down, your whole robot doesn't work. Uh, so here's this, again, I love going back to the specifications. Here's what National Instrument puts out. It's an FPGA board, um, which can do all the little switches and communications and bring cameras into it. And this is a breakdown of what the voltage is. Because you can see when you get to the power here, Nat, this is another device. Um, first, does not let us use the VRM for it, but this would be another thing if it starts losing power this thing starts glitching out and it'll give you what's called a brownout. And when that voltage drops below these this range in here, 6.8 and that, you'll start getting brownouts. And uh, the field management system will tell us that. And usually you'll get a visit from a friendly person in an orange hat called control system advisor to come and help you look at. What's very important about this when you mount these and stuff is you see all these little pins on here, make sure you cover them up. And that's why you see our board right here. It's a double-sided board. It's removable from the robot. And so that's one of the big reasons why we do that. So if we need to drill and tap or grind or sand off or file, we don't get any shaves in here. I was at the Champs a couple of years ago and we opened one of these robo reels off of a team in a divisional round playoffs there. And it was full of shavings. It's real easy to get shavings in here. And what they start doing is they start shorting out, which causes the voltage down, which will give you brownouts. Talks about the IO and the communication ports on here. Again, it's just being familiar with what you're trying to integrate in here. And this is another um, picture. There's a full manual um, for this National Instrument Robo Reel on the websites for NI. So here's another point where I like to ask questions. You gotta understand um, the electrical side when you're looking at using this robo reel, particularly on the, how the uh, digital IO works and stuff. And I always like to throw out the questions and asking about, you know, if, who knows about sourcing or um, sourcing is, or the, um, in my point, it's basically NPN or, N, or PNP, you know, source or pull it down the ground. So we always do this at Delta here as well, is we look at our sensors and what they're made for and see if how we're going to wire it. Because it makes a difference if it, the signal is going to drop the ground to turn on, or you can apply a voltage to that pin to make it come on internally. So what's important is you look at this diagram and look at the device you're going to order. So when you're ordering sensors, Make sure you understand sourcing or syncing because there are different sensors and they can both be used on the robo reel. You just gotta make sure you understand how to connect it. 
make them work. Um, the custom electronics port allows for the expansion of the control system I.O. based on the specific needs. So uh, you can have an active device or circuit, which uh, basically controls and converts a source of electrical energy by the application of external uh, electrical stimulus. Uh, MPX, uh, my Rio expansion port. Uh, then you have passive devices or circuits or any device whose capability is limited to the conduction and or static regulation of the electrical energy applied to it. So wires, uh, splices, connectors, or printed wiring boards. Yep, you'll see them. They'll be mounted right on top of there. Um, Teams use them quite a bit on different uh, camera systems and stuff for doing their motion profiles. So we're going to get into a little bit here, a little more particular on how the overall design of the circuits are that we showed in the first screen. Again, we just make sure everyone understands the difference between a CAN bus and using PWMs. And here's shows kind of the daisy chain up close. There are first does an awesome job of putting this in color coded. So you'll see all your black and your reds for your 12 volts or zero on your black. And then they did the same thing with the CAN bus here. The CAN bus has the yellow and green wires on here and it's color coded. And Robo Real, it spells it out, L and H, which is the green and the yellow. And you can see every device. So right here, we talked about the pneumatic control valve controller module here. This has the same thing, it's color code. Put the green where the green is and put the yellow where the yellow is. It. What's important is the CAN bus is twisted. And why is that twisted? I have no idea. Come on. I don't know. All right. <laughs> They're twisted because it's a communication line and they do it for noise reasons to eliminate the noise on there. Not for RF noise or something? Yes. So CAN bus ain't communications. I see this all the time in our in, in industry. We always use twisted pair wires with a shield wire a lot of time to eliminate any noise in the system. So again, you wanna start the robo reel and you wanna make your way all the way through the devices. What's also is important is this, at the very end of the daisy chain, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the power distribution board, but the power distribution board leaves you a nice convenient way to terminate it. And what that means is, if me and Jake were sitting here and we had 50 people in here, I want to talk to the guy at the end. Um, we got to go through everyone in the 50 people. But it would never come back to me because it's an open link. So at the last person on there would be the returner. So what is called is a terminating resistor in there. And the friends at uh, Crossroad Electronics has put one in for convenience on these robots. So on the power distribution board, you can see it down here is highlighted. There's a termination point here and that basically closes the loop, returns it back so it can send receive back. If you do not have one of them, good luck trying to feed, see all your devices on the daisy chain because there's a uh, utilities and software that will show us that. Uh, this is the battery and circuit breaker. So on the left, you can see the circuit breaker. That's basically like the main switch for the robot. Like we said before, you have to wire the positive lead of the battery to the uh, breaker just because then if you shut it off, it immediately cuts all the power so the robot will shut off. Uh, in the middle, you can see a picture of battery where the leads were not put on correctly. When you get the battery, you have to put the leads on. They don't ship them with the leads on there. So you need to make sure that it's done correctly. As you can see on the right, they have some kind of like a 3D printed cover that they put on there to just to protect those leads. But don't do what was in the middle there. It, it just, it's, it won't work, it's garbage. It's prone to fail at some point. So make sure that those are properly electrical taped or even put the 3D printed covers on there if you have access to a 3D printer. Yeah, so from a design standpoint, one thing you gotta pay attention to is battery mounting location and usually on robot builds it's the last thing you'd think of where's the battery going to be mounted so then it kind of is a 
game to see how we can fit it on a robot and which orientation the battery is. So if you're planning on doing some 3D printing of these, you got to keep in mind which way the battery is going to be orientated. Is it going to be horizontal? Is it going to be vertical? Where is it relationship to the disconnect? Because this direction right here may not work in every design of the robot. And yeah, like Jake said, please don't do this. We have uh, a lot of failures on the field when I come around as well. And the first thing I do is we feel if, there, if the cable is warm or hot and if it's loose. And a lot of times when the robots have issues on the field, this is one of the big concerns is that wire is not tightened on here. You really got to reef down on these and you can do this where you push on it and they don't come loose. So make sure they're tight on there and use shrink tube on there. Any questions on that? Ask away any questions you may have on there before we get into the, the programming languages. But it's kind of a snapshot again. We're just giving you the overview and some tips and uh, tricks for putting it all together. Again, uh, in November 14th, we're going to be giving our full electrical presentation on making the connections and stuff. So part of the FRC system here is once showing you the hardware layout and everything. And the last thing we're going to kind of cover here is the languages that you can use to program this robo reel to do it what you need to do. And there's right now there's still only three official languages supported by first. Even though Python has been growing and growing uh, more popularity, there is uh, a few teams still using Python, um, but it's not officially supported, but can be used. So the three languages is Java, C, C++, and LabVIEW. Uh, LabVIEW is great for beginners, and it, it really, um, if you don't know much about programming, you can use it. Um, I do not teach that part of what I help mentor teams on, but it's a very good way to just start out with uh, connecting wires to blocks and uh, a schematic type programming language versus a structured text, which uh, C++ and uh, Java would be. Uh, LabVIEW for FRC is based on the National Instruments. Um, LabVIEW, they probably come out with a new one, but the base one was 2018, a year ago. Um, so there's uh, choices you can make with doing that language. You know, um, we have recognized a lot of schools are not teaching any structured languages and stuff, but there's a lot of students out there and Jake's one of them that play with 3D printers and other things, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and some of that programming is very uh, a stepping stone for what you can use with the Java or C++ language. And I, I recommend I was lab, um, uh, lab view for teams that just don't have any real support on there. Um, but Java is a good starter language with the scripting and that, that a lot of these other devices use. So um, just something to consider when you're looking at that. Again, you know, C++ is a heavy duty uh, object oriented type text-based language on there. Um, it can get confusing with some of the headers and stuff, files and implementation with the C++ files, but it's very doable. We have people in the state of Minnesota that do use uh, the view and use a fair amount of C++ a lot less lately. There's a lot more Java teams in the state of Minnesota, at least that I know of. But Java is one of the main ones that a lot of teams use and it uses uh, the Java package and stuff. And right now everything's being developed with a visual code. Um, this is not the programming class, but Visual Code is free. You can download it from uh, the Microsoft website. It's a stripped down version of their full developer package that they, most people in the industry use, like I use here at work with the uh, Visual Studio. It's a stripped down version called Visual Code. And you can download it and get the FRC libraries if you're interested in looking at that. But that, that in a nutshell, is the three languages supported. We do have some uh, LabVIEW people in the state of Minnesota, so we have a lot of support for that as well. Any other questions? Anything that you're dying to know about the FRC control system? How we do things, what we're looking at? Well, 
what are the pros and cons of using either Java or C++. Um, pointers is a big thing in memory. <laughs> Java is a more forgiving language. It's built on just-in-time compiler. <laughs> so you could be loosely on there. You could, you would be able to overwrite things in Java, which could be, it's good and bad because you'd be less frustrated with um, programming because you won't get as many compiler errors, but can be frustrating on a different level as things ain't working because you could overwrite something real easy in Java. And the other thing is when you really get into the core things, it's not good for memory. It likes to have memory leaks and can cause issues, but it's a very basic language. Syntax is very easy to get through. Um, the C++, very powerful. So if, uh, person was really into doing some of the data collection and really doing it um, higher level things. It's a higher level language that you have to really pay attention to how you program everything and how you set your pointers up and pointers are on the, the stack and heap on there and how you implement libraries. It could be a little more confusing on the syntax versus Java. So on the big picture, either one is not bad. Because if you go to first on their uh, FRC docs web link, they uh, what first did is they put some great stuff out and they ran it real easy in all three languages. And that's why I said there's the only three languages supported because there's a ton of examples. And they laid out the libraries and said, here's a simple drivetrain. So if you're familiar with some of that, and some of the adrenal stuff in that is in more of a C type syntax as well than Java, right? Yeah, so yeah, the Arduinos use like a like a specialized version of C++ that has things like pin mode in it, you know, like that regular C++ might not have. So mm -hmm. it has its own like library that you have to import into, into the C++ IDE. And then that brings in like things like pin mode to declare, okay, we maybe we want pin one to be an input or pin two to be an output. Right. So the Arduino is a little bit different, but it's based on C++. Right. In, in the bottom line between the two, it's just syntax, right? They all, they both languages use is a semicolon and the curly brackets, the breakup beginning and end of the code. It's just dealing with the extra level of the header files and stuff like that. So we hope we answer your question. I'll get too deep on there. Um, both language, I can read both languages. I'm just more efficient at the Java and then the .NET program that I do here at work. But it's important to note that FIRST does an awesome job with their uh, um, libraries and stuff and code examples. There's a ton out there and other sessions. Uh, we'll be having more programming sessions next uh, event in November as well. There'll be some more coding, programming uh, classes as well in there. Any other questions? I was looking for an updated picture. Oh, we got to take, take one. We I, I, I know we have them for 2020, but this is their 2019 robot here that we designed and use a lot of motion, motion profiling there with motion magic with the CTRE and the Talon robots and stuff. I mean, one of the other devices we didn't show in our presentation we should have updated was the Falcon. Um, it's a $130 motion and controller bundled together. Um, I see that they're always uh, stock currently at CTRE and Andy Mark and Vexpro right now, but it really combines everything in one. But the, the downfall could be on them motors is if you burn out the encoder, um, you're either stuck putting an external coder on there or swapping out the whole motor and stuff too, but it integrates everything into one. It's a Eliminates the wires because the wires will go directly from the power distribution board right to the motor. And it's the motor and controller all in one. And we have one of the beta motors still. And I think it's, isn't it slightly cheaper too? Because the uh, Falcon motor is, what, what is it, like 140 bucks or something? Yeah. And then I think the uh, Talon SRXs are $90 already. And, uh, plus the SIM encoders. Motors. Plus the encoders. Yeah. Sim motors, I don't remember how much those were, but they were probably, what were they, 30, 40 bucks? Yeah. Yeah, so you're, it's probably cheaper to go with the uh, Falcons, but like Todd said, they're 
if, if one part fails, you're either stuck replacing the motor or trying to wire an external encoder or something. Questions, statements, anyone got anything to add? Things you'd like to see? Again, we, we enjoy being part of this today as uh, the first the virtual full event here with Medtronic. Can't thank Medtronic enough for allowing us to use their Zoom conferencing today. And then just look forward to uh, next time, which will be November 14th. And this is where me and uh, Jake here are sitting in the building that I work at Delta Mod Tech. And we're going to be live streaming from this location next event on November 14th. Uh, we're going to be doing a live demo of our machines here. Um, giving you a walk to the facility here at Delta, as well as an uh, interview with our owner or one of the owners here at Delta and the reason for their support for FIRST. And we also have an alumni from 7068 that will be joining us and also an intern here at Delta. So um, come back next time in November here and join us for that. Any other questions? We're about out of time. Matea hasn't said anything, but we're right there against the clock. If you have any yeah. questions, go ahead. Um, I just want to say thank you, Todd. That was such a great presentation and we got so many good questions. Um, just a reminder too, November 14th, Delta Mod Tech will be hosting part two of Jumpstart. So don't forget and we'll see you then. Thank you, Taya. Any other questions? No problem. We enjoy doing this. I've been involved with Jumpstart since the beginning. Back over six years ago, we started this concept and now we're growing to three events instead of just the one. So hopefully soon we'll all be together and we can enjoy first to a full experience, wild and crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone have a good day. Thanks for attending our session and hopefully see everyone November 14th. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.